Isaiah 49, and I'm going to read 22 and 23. And our topic today is the civil magistrate. And we're on numbers, I believe, 8 and 9. And our topic is an excursus on the state as the nursing mother to the church. And this is a very important topic because we're discussing the establishment principle and we want to make sure that our version of the establishment principle, the idea that the state should be an explicitly Christian state, is fully in accord with the word of God. And there are some views out there that are what I've labeled Christian statist, and we're going to examine those today. And in the process, we're going to learn a lot about, uh, especially this afternoon, on what the Bible has to say about the poor. We'll have almost a whole hour on just what the Bible has to say about the poor. But I'm going to read 22 and 23. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will lift up mine hand to the Gentiles, and set up my standard to the people. And they shall bring thy sons in their arms, and their daughters shall be carried upon their shoulders. And kings shall be thy nursing fathers, and their queens thy nursing mothers. They shall bow down to thee with their face toward the earth, and lick up the dust of thy feet. Thou shalt know that I am the Lord, for they shall not be ashamed that wait for me. Now, thus far we have seen that the Bible assigns a very limited role to the state in society. Last week we looked at, in the morning and evening, the different covenantal spheres and how they, although each are directly under the Lord Jesus Christ, they each have different responsibilities and they're not to intrude upon uh, the responsibilities, for example, of the parents. The state's not to intrude upon that and the church is not to intrude upon it either, certain duties, and uh, vice versa. <coughs> Those who hold to a 17th century understanding of the establishment principle, however, believe that a civil magistrate should be very active in many areas that the Bible presents as proper belonging to other covenantal spheres. That's what we're going to look at today. <clears throat> they argue for such a view based prior, primarily on Isaiah 49, 23. Kings shall be your foster fathers and their queens your nursing mothers. Um, that's the primary verse, which is very, as we're going to see, is a very general verse. We're going to look at the verse, but we're going to go into detail. Before we turn our attention to statist abuses of the establishment principle, we need to briefly note two things. First, we want to make it absolutely clear, perfectly clear, that the statist interpretation of the establishment principle is not taught nor countenanced in the Westminster Standards. <clears throat> and I'm going to read the section on the civil magistrate and every single one of these points our church is in fully agreement with our denomination is in full agreement with and the fact that certain people in the 17th century believed certain things that are not in the standards does not mean that we have to believe what they believed because they are not in the standards let me read this <clears throat> number one God the supreme lord this is from section uh, chapter 28 in the Westminster Confession God, the Supreme Lord and King of all the world, hath ordained civil magistrates to be under him over the people for his own glory and the public good. And to this end hath armed them with the power of the sword for the defense and encouragement of them that are good and for the punishment of evildoers. Number two. It is lawful for Christians to accept and execute the office of a magistrate when called thereunto. <coughs> And the management whereof, as they ought especially to maintain piety, justice, and peace according to the wholesome laws of each commonwealth. So that for that end they may lawfully, now under the New Testament, wage war upon just and necessary occasions. Number three. The civil magistrate may not assume to himself the administration of the word and sacraments or the power of the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Yet he hath authority, and it is his duty to take order that unity and peace be preserved in the church, that the truth of God be kept pure and entire, that all blasphemies and heresies be suppressed, all corruptions and abuses in worship and discipline prevented and reformed, and all the ordinances of God duly settled, administered, and observed, for the better effecting whereof, whereof he hath power to call synods, to be present at them, and to provide that whatsoever is transacted in them be according to the mind of God. Now, to stop for a moment, most conservative Presbyterian denominations reject uh, 
much of that last paragraph, and we're gonna, Lord willing, in the next few weeks, we're gonna actually look at these duties, and we will see that they are indeed biblical. <clears throat> and then number four. <clears throat> it is the duty of people to pray for magistrates, to honor their persons, to pay them tribute and other dues, and to obey their lawful commands, and to be subject to their authority for conscience sake. Infidelity or difference in religion doth not make void the magistrate's just and legal authority, nor free the people from their due obedience to him, from which ecclesiastical persons are not exempted. Much less hath the Pope any power or jurisdiction over them in their dominions, or over any of their people, and least of all to deprive them of their dominions or lives, if he shall judge them to be heretics, or any other pretense whatsoever. Okay, that's the Westminster Confession of Faith, its statement on the civil magistrate. And with that, we are in 100% agreement. Our denomination and our church and our elders. Now note, <coughs> there is nothing in this section about the civil magistrate providing tax-funded, taxpayer financed state education, health care and welfare programs for the poor. There's not a word about it. It may be that many of the Westminster divines believe in such things, and that some even publicly advocated such things. But when an elder or a minister subscribes to the Westminster standards, he swears to uphold what is written therein, not what is unwritten. Do you understand? When we, if somebody swears to a document, they're swearing to what's in the document. The argument that since many of the authors of Westminster Standards believed in a type of Christian welfare state, and many of them did, they wanted state schools financed by taxes, they wanted taxes to pay for ministers and church schools, they wanted state-funded uh, state education, they wanted all sorts of things. Uh, but none of that made it into the Westminster Confession of Faith. <clears throat> The argument is that many of the authors of Westminster Standards believe in a type of Christian welfare state, we must adhere to such a position to be faithful to the original intent of the standards is fallacious. Now remember, original intent, and this is important in the debate in the United States over the Constitution, original intent refers to the original intent of what is actually written. You understand that? To apply the principle of original intent to something that was privately believed, but deliberately left out of the actual document, is disingenuous. I bring that up because people who uh, believe in the old-fashioned version of the establishment principle, they bludgeon people with, you're not being confessional, you're not being confessional. That's not true. We are fully confessional. As long as we adhere strictly to what is in the confession itself, we are being confessional. <clears throat> it could be used, this idea that, we, ha that uh, we have to adhere to what they simply believe but didn't put in the confession, it could be used to prove all sorts of absurd doctrines and, and ideas. <clears throat> For example, it would be akin uh, to, to arguing, well, many of the founding fathers were dedicated Freemasons. George Washington, a number of them. Gary North has written about this. Many of them were highly dedicated to it. Well, we could be, um, since they were, they could argue, based on this kind of argumentation, that the Constitution teaches that we should all be Freemasons. But it does not. It does not. We should be thankful that the authors of the standards were careful to list requirements of the civil magistrate that were easy to prove from Scripture. Everything that I've enumerated in the Westminster Confession of Faith, as we're going to see as we look at as we look at it, all of those things are actually easy to prove. Contrary to modern Presbyterianism, which has rejected some of those things due to pluralism, they're easy to prove from Scripture, every one of them. A Christian status will sometimes argue that the Westminster Confession does advocate their position when it speaks of the magistrate's duty to maintain a, and this is 28.2, justice according to the wholesome laws of each commonwealth. And they like to point out that the scripture proves, one of them, annexed 
uh, to the statement says this. This is um, oh, Psalm 82, 3 to 4. Deliver the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Rid them out of the hand of the wicked. Now, does this not teach that the ruler is to use his authority to make sure there is social justice in the land, that the poor and needy are fed and clothed and receive their fair share of the economic pie? Isn't that, isn't that what the psalm is teaching? <clears throat> while, while, while such an interpretation has become very popular in the last 40 years due to the influence of people like Ronald Sider, and such views were adopted uh, to a degree in the 70s by the RPCNA and uh, sadly by Presbyterians in Scotland, <clears throat> it has nothing to do with the meaning or intent of the original author. Nothing to do with it. The many passages which speak of justice to the poor, widows, orphans, and the helpless in society, and when you get a chance you can look up Isaiah 117, Deuteronomy, 27, 19, 22, 24, 22 to 24, Exodus 23, 6, Leviticus 19, 15, etc. Have absolutely nothing to do with state welfare programs to the poor. They're emphasizing that the strict impartiality in the administration of justice toward the poor. You can look at every one of them, look at the context. The impartiality in the administration of justice toward the poor. Because the people who were poor and weak did not have the money or the social status to impress corrupt judges. Whenever you have a corrupt culture, a corrupt society, one of the first people to be oppressed is the poor. Because they can't make bribes, they can't pay off lawyers, they can't do all these things that the rich can do. They have no one to plead their cause or defend them. Hence, in a true theocracy, the weakest member should receive a just treatment. A just treatment. Inasmuch as an unjust judge realizes that he will receive no bribe or reward from the widow or the orphan. And he has no concern to defend them. That was a common problem in ancient Israel. And it is a common problem throughout history. And this view is proved by the immediate context of Psalm 82, which says this in verse 2. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? <clears throat> well, who were the wicked? They were the ones offering the judges bribes. They were cheating the poor out of their wages. They were doing all sorts of wicked things to the poor, and if the poor took them to court, they weren't receiving any justice whatsoever. This statement in Psalm 82 is analogous to the many other statements of Scripture that deal with this topic. And here's a few more. Isaiah 3, 13 to 15, Micah 3, 1 to 4, and Jeremiah 22, 1 and following. God becomes angry when the administration of justice is corrupted by money and favoritism. The poor and the helpless always suffer wrong in such situations because in a corrupt culture, money skids the wheels. Money can get you out of a lot of trouble in a corrupt society. And if you're poor, you don't have any money. <clears throat> God hates all forms of favoritism, injustice, even favoritism toward the poor, which is we tend to have today. Even favoritism toward the poor. Exodus 23, 2-3. To argue that the confession is advocating the state-enforced redistribution of wealth is not only not supported by such passages, but actually contradicts them. For the Christian status position has the civil government showing favoritism toward the poor over the rich in the economic sphere. Okay, the state does not have a biblical right to tax rich people at a higher rate than poor people simply because it believes in, quote, social justice. It doesn't have that right. And to take what, uh, more from somebody simply because of their social class than others is theft. Okay. 
To take someone's money against God's word is theft, even if one's intentions sound noble. Statists, socialists, Christian welfare stage, fascists, always use terms of compassion as they violate biblical law. <clears throat> it is the establishment of social injustice in the name of justice. That's exactly what it is. Social injustice in the name of justice. And we see that today in the so-called 99, the hippie vermin who are protesting, who are a bunch of rich white kids primarily, or upper middle class white kids and middle class white kids who uh, have no, uh, who are not starving or not poor. Uh, they want communism or socialism. So in the name of justice, they want injustice. Second, <clears throat> as we deal with theological differences, it is important to keep in mind some important her hermeneutical principles. This is the key thing. The interpretation of scripture is the key. When we come to a passage that makes a very general statement, for example, the state is a foster father or nursing mother to the church, we must not read our presuppositions into that passage about the role of a uh, civil magistrate in society, but rather interpret the passage in light of the clearer, detailed responsibilities of the state found in many other passages. In other words, the explicit detailed passages that discuss the particular responsibilities of the state must be used to flesh out or fill in the details of this very general prophetic passage. Okay, the state's a foster father, the, uh, the, the king's a foster father, the queen's a nursing mother. That's a very, very general statement. It doesn't tell you how. Scripture cannot contradict Scripture. And I bring up this point because essentially what Christian statists or socialists do is the exact opposite of this interpretive procedure. They arrive at an, uh, <coughs> of an interpretation of a, a very general passage, a non-specific passage. Remember, we're not told how the state is to be a foster father or nursing mother in Isaiah 49. 23. We're not told how. And then they ignore or twist the meaning of the many explicit passages, and there are many, as we'll see, in order, because they don't want anything to contradict their paradigm of Christian statism or Christian socialism. So the Christian statist must engage in exegetical malpractice in order to try and prove his position from the Bible. Another important interpretive consideration is that Scripture alone, sola scriptura, must ultimately guide our view of the passage and not church traditions and not church history. Now, if you do your homework and you do careful biblical exegesis and you want to go back to church history and support your position, that's fine. But don't go to church history and say, well, this is what church history says. We're going to accept this and then try to force scripture to concur with what church history says. That's, that's a very Roman Catholic procedure. The Westminster Confession correctly notes, 31.4, that all synods or councils since the apostle times, whether general or particular, may err, and many have erred. Therefore, they are not to be made the rule of faith or practice, but are to be used as a help in both. Consequently, and this is Confession of Faith 110, the supreme judge by which all controversies of religion and all decrees of councils, opinions of ancient writers, doctrines of men, and private spirits are to be examined, and in whose sentence we are to rest, can be no other but the Holy Spirit speaking in the Scripture. So if you go, well, you know, I found this in Rutherford, or I found this in Calvin, that's wonderful. You still have to prove it from Scripture. We can't just blindly accept whatever people said, no matter how godly or good they were. Uh, for example, one of the best little books on prayer that's out there is a little book by Augustine. 
The book is absolutely fantastic until you get to the last chapter, Prayers for the Dead. Okay, you can't just accept something because Augustine was a great theologian, the greatest theologian before Calvin. No, people make mistakes. Test all things by scripture. <clears throat> Now, this point is brought up because there are a number of Christians in conservative Presbyterian circles who basically hold to the position that we should uncritically accept whatever was practiced or held by the Presbyterians of the Second Reformation period in Scotland, 1638-1650. It is argued that the common view of the establishment principle found in sermons, books, and articles of that period represent the standard Protestant interpretation. Therefore, to depart from their views in any of the particulars is a betrayal of the Reformation. In other words, how dare you come to me with your biblical exegesis? The church has spoken on this matter. Shut up and just simply submit to what they did in the past. And once again, that's a very Roman Catholic way of looking at things. That's not the way to do theology. While this period was perhaps the most pure time period in history for the church since the days of the apostles. And of course, the Westminster Standards are the greatest theological confessional document produced by the Church of Christ in all history. The most precise, the most well thought out, the most, care the most carefully written, the best. No question about it. In all of human history, we don't deny that. We are still responsible to test the arguments used at that time by a careful, detailed exegesis of Scripture. As noted, the church, even in the best of times, may err. They can err and they have erred. To ignore the stack and blindly accept everything the church said at a given time, or to refuse to go to the law and the testimony to prove all things from the Bible oneself, is more, more in league with the Roman Catholic view of authority than of biblical Protestantism. Paul certainly wouldn't object when he preached to the Bereans the gospel. <clears throat> everything he said, they went back to the Old Testament to see if what he said, said was true. He didn't get mad and say, hey, I'm Paul, you should accept what I say. He commended them for taking every single thing he said and he tested it. They tested it by looking at scripture. And that's what we're to do. We are to believe in the inspiration and fallibility of Scripture, not the church. Not the church. And once again, our denomination, I believe, holds the strictest view of holding to the Westminster Standards of any denomination that I know of, even stricter than the free church continuum. So I, I respect church history. I respect the standards, but we still have to go to Scripture. With these things in mind, we're going to take a look. first a general look at Isaiah 49, 23, and then examine the status inferences drawn from that text. Then, of course, we're going to go into the details. And that's, that's what's important. What are, what are the details about poverty? What are the details about education in the Bible? <clears throat> Although this passage may have an initial reference to the remnant of Israel and the restoration to Jerusalem, and the land after the captivity under the fatherly protection of the Medo-Persian Empire. Uh, and anybody who knows history in particular, that would be Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes. The vast majority of commentators see its chief fulfillment in the New Covenant era. And I think we saw that by the immediate context, talking about the Gentiles. As McCree uh, notes in his wonderful work on uh, in favor of the establishment principle, he writes this, <coughs> quote, these promises and of course he's referring to Isaiah 49, 23, and then there's a parallel passage in uh, 60, 10, 12, and 16. I'll go ahead and read it real quick. This is Isaiah, this is a parallel passage. We're not going to look at it just because it's so similar to this one. Uh, this, Isaiah 60, starting at verse 10. The sons of foreigners shall build up your walls, and their king shall minister to you. And in my, for in my wrath I struck you, but in my favor I had mercy on you. Therefore your gates shall be open continually, they shall not be shut day or night, that men may bring to you the wealth of the Gentiles and their kings in procession. For the nation and kingdom which will not serve you shall perish. 
you shall drink the milk of Gentiles and milk the breast of kings. You shall know that I, the Lord, am your Savior and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. Okay, once again, a prophecy of the future. But here, here's what he says. These promises secure unto the church the public countenance of kings and kingdoms as such. Kings shall be your nursing fathers. Nations and kingdoms shall serve her. The authority and means competent unto them as such shall be employed in the sight of the church and for the advancement of the true religion. Whereas they had firmly been employed against her and for the support of a false religion. To limit the sense of the words to that common protection which is given to all subjects and to any society is to explain away the promises of God. It is equally unreasonable to confine the meaning to the private or personal conduct of rulers and of their subjects. This should never suggest itself to any who in reading the passage had not formed the notion that the church cannot be benefited by civil power. It offers violence to the plain meaning of the words. It does not accord with the context which speaks of the public state of the church and those means which tend to advance its interest in this view. End of quote. And this is a very common view. Let me just give you a few more. Uh, the English reformer, Cranmer, wrote this. <coughs> Worldly dominion shall tend to this, that is, to seek the best advantage of the church of God and maintain its protection. Otherwise, if God were not concerned about his church, kings and princes would have no use on earth. Matthew Poole. Kings and queens shall have a sincere affection and tender regard unto thee and thy children, which was in some sort fulfilled in Cyrus and Ashuerus and some few other of the Persian kings or queens, but much more truly and fully by those kings and emperors of the Gentile world, which after Christ's time did both themselves embrace the true religion and also set it up in their several dominions. John Gill. Literally of the kings and queens of this earth, and is thought to have its influence it, uh, at least in part in Cyrus, Ashuerus, and Esther, and others, but more so in Christian kings and queens as Constantine and Helena, Theodosius and Placilla, and others, which will have a far greater accomplishment in the latter day glory. Here's another one, Matthew Henry. The Christian church, after a long captivity, was happy in some such kings and queens as Constantine and his mother Helena. And after there's Theodosius and others who nursed the church with all possible care and tenderness. Whenever the scepter of government is put into the hand of religious princes, then this promise is fulfilled. The church in this world is in an infant state, and it is in the power of princes and magistrates to do it a great deal of service. And here's Patrick Fairbarn. When Isaiah makes a promise to the church of kings being her nursing fathers and queens her nursing mothers, the forces of the Gentiles coming to her and kings ministering to her with many such more of like kind, such passes plainly imply that while the struggle was still pending between the cause of Christ and the powers of the world, while the people of God were still in need of help for the conflict in which they were to, had to engage, different nations and their rulers would successively give in their adherence and contribute their aid to the final result. And I'll stop there. There are many other. So this is a common view of commentators, especially the older ones, and even the newer ones. This prophetic passage indicates that a time is coming when biblical Christianity will be the established religion of nations. Civil rulers will suppress false religions and idolatry in accordance with biblical law and will do everything they can within their own sphere of authority to promote Christianity. Okay, so in a Christian civil uh, commonwealth, you're not going to have new mosques being built. You're not going to have any mosques. You're not going to have synagogues. You're not going to have Hindu temples. It's going to drive false religion underground. Now, while everyone agrees that the fatherly protection of the church involves the state's role in punishing evildoers, especially with regard to the first table of the law, the area over which major differences have arisen is over the state's positive role. This is the area of disagreement. Everybody, we all agree that the, in enforcing biblical law, idolatry and false religions are going to be suppressed. That's crystal clear because that's part of biblical law. Now before we look at the differences and examine them under the light of scripture, we will look at uh, the parts of Calvin's view with which we are in general agreement 
And then we're going to define the expressions foster fathers and nursing mothers. Okay, we're going to look, continue to look at the passage. Here's what Calvin says. <clears throat> and we cannot underestimate the importance of Calvin. He, uh, he had more influence over the Reformed churches of the 17th century than anyone. And keep in mind, his, one of his disciples was John Knox. Here's what Calvin says. He compares kings to hired men who bring up the children of others and queens to nurses who give out their labor for hire. Why so? Because kings and queens shall supply everything that is necessary for nourishing the offspring of the church. Having formerly, formerly driven out Christ in their dominions, they shall henceforth acknowledge him to be the supreme king and shall render to him all honor, obedience, and worship. End of quote. Now Calvin said that civil magistrates have a duty to use their riches to, quote, uh, to raise up and maintain the church of Christ so as to be her guardians and defenders. The civil magistrate must protect the church by removing superstitions and putting an end to all wicked idolatry, by advancing the kingdom of Christ and maintaining purity of doctrine, about purging scandals and cleaning from the filth that corrupts piety and impairs the luster of divine majesty. Calvin recognized that a restoration of the church was needed before a reformation of the state. Here's what he says. We, we ought to hope for a restoration of the church and such a conversion of kings that they show themselves to be nursing fathers and protectors of believers and shall bravely defend the doctrine of the word. End of quote. Now, Calvin did not believe in Erasianism. He did not believe that the church was a uh, sub-department under the state. He rejected that, and so did all the Presbyterians. He knew, however, that a, uh, if a civil magistrate is not for Jesus Christ, that he's going to be against them. And if a civil magistrate is for Jesus Christ, and he obeys God's law, he's going to be for the church. He's going to be out to help the church as best he can. While it is not... Uh, tenable to argue that the state will supply everything that is necessary for nourishing the offspring of the church. It's a little sloppy. Uh, there is a sense in which the state will offer some kind of help to the church beyond the suppression of crime, false religions, and heresy. Okay, I don't have any problem accepting that. <clears throat> this can be inferred from the expression foster fathers. Now the Hebrew word here Amna, which has been translated as foster fathers, nursing fathers, guardians, shall tend. Uh, this noun is the same one used of Esther's, Esther's having been sustained, strengthened, and guided by Mordecai as a child in uh, Esther 2.20. It can mean to nurture, sustain, bring up, or support. In 2 Kings 10, 1 and 5, the same word is used to describe the rearing of Ahab's sons. It is used to describe a tutor, guardian, or attendant in the Old Testament. In Numbers 11, 12, it is used to describe supporting or carrying a child with an arm, holding a child in your arms. E.J. Young writes this, he notes this, the foster fathers, literally supporters, are said to be kings. And those who give suck to her are princesses. Women of royal station, queens. Thus, the language advances. Even the highest and most powerful rulers of the heathen nations will reverence the church and devote to her all their wealth and power. Like the two verbs in the preceding verse, foster fathers and those who give thee suck express the tender love with which the nations cherish Zion and her sons. End of quote. As Young notes, the expression nursing mothers reinforces and advances the meaning of foster fathers. <clears throat> Instead of the civil magistrate taking a hostile attitude toward the church, which is what we have today and which, what we've had through most of history, or even a supposed neutrality towards Christianity, which is supposedly the position of the United States today, but it's, there is no such thing as neutrality, so it's a position of hostility. <clears throat> he can, he will care, love, nurture, protect, and support the church of Christ. Christianity will um, an example of that 
that help, as we see how this passage is fulfilled in the New Covenant era, can be found in the Roman Empire. Uh, Poole refers to this, and of course, Gill, who's heavily dependent upon Poole, refers to this as well. For three centuries, the Roman emperors, by every means possible, attended to extirpate the church. But after, the empire was leavened with the gospel, and the emperor professed Christ, Constantine. The church was protected and became the official religion of the empire. And one of the things they did is as, the, as idolatry waned and temples were closed down, these temples were given to the church. And that's why some of the oldest buildings in the world, some of the, uh, there's a, the largest concrete dome until recent times in the Roman Empire. The reason those buildings are preserved is because they were churches. That's the only reason they, they continued. Here's what William Edgar writes. <clears throat> For at least a generation after Constantine, it was unclear whether Christianity would supplant paganism as the official religion of the empire. But after Julian's failed attempt to restore paganism, it became clear that the power of the Roman government would firmly support the church and would discourage paganism. According to Theodore of Cyprus, writing in AD 450, Julian cried it out as he died, Galilean, you have conquered. While it is doubtful that Julian actually said these words, they express the truth. Jesus had conquered. <clears throat> the kings of Rome had been subdued. They no longer claimed to rule by reason of their own divinity. They acknowledged that they ruled by the grace of God, just as the kings of ancient Israel had so ruled. Real sovereignty belongs to God, alone and to his Christ. Emperor Constantine began a process whereby Roman law started to reflect biblical law. For example, laws transforming the first day of the week, the Lord's Day, into a day of rest were enacted. Under Christian influence, laws protecting slaves, peasants, children, and women were passed. And branding criminals on the face was forbidden because man was made in the image of God. Okay, so we have a basic understanding of the Isaiah 49.23 passage. With this in mind, we come to the interpretation which sees this passage as an endorsement of Christian statism. <clears throat> this is the idea that the Christian civil magistrate should be intimately involved in all sorts of things that according to the clear and more detailed passages belong properly to the covenant or spheres of the family and the church. Okay, this is my problem with Christian statism, and that's why I call it statism. When you attribute to the church, excuse me, the state, that which belongs to the family and to the church, responsibilities. <clears throat> the reason such views were so popular with Protestant scholars in the 16th and 17th centuries was probably due to an ignorance to how God's word carefully separates the responsibilities of different covenantal spheres. So that power could not be concentrated so that an authority, the state, would dominate all other spheres. Now, this is really important stuff because uh, the state has the power of the sword. The state has the power of the gun. The state has the power of coercion, physical coercion. The family and the, and the uh, church can't stand up to it. So it's extremely important that the biblical limits placed on the state be maintained. The state needs to be limited. And it's limited very clearly by Scripture. And if we go beyond those limits, we're contributing in the long run to the state persecuting the church. <clears throat> In addition, the early reformers were strongly influenced by the late medieval worldview, which in many ways was statist and did not consistently tie the ruler's law system to the judicial laws of scripture. <clears throat> As a common example of how the older Protestant scholars applied Isaiah 49, 23 in a very broad manner, we turn to John Calvin who, as I noted, he had a great influence over the Reformed churches. He was the most important writer of the 1500s. There's nobody more important than John Calvin. The greatest theologian of his day, no question. In his commentary on this passage, he writes this. Undoubtedly, 
While kings bestow careful attention on these things, they at the same time supply the pastors and ministers of the word with all that is necessary for food and maintenance, provide for the poor, and guard the church against the disgrace of pauperism, erect schools, and appoint salaries for the teachers, and board for the students, build poor houses and hospitals, and make every other arrangement that belongs to the protection and defense of the church. End of quote. Now, if Calvin is talking about using his own money, the king, using his own money to do this, I have no problem with it at all. If, if the king wants to donate to the church or families, that's great. Or the state takes booty taken in the just war for gifts to the churches, that would not be contrary to scripture. But what most establishmentarians advocate is the state taxing the population and then using the money for all such programs. The reason such a view is justly called Christian statism is because it takes biblical presupposed uh, responsibilities that belong to families, individuals, and churches, and it places them under state authority. Okay, this is what's bad. This is what's dangerous. It takes responsibilities of families, of the church, and of individuals, and places them in the hands of the state. That is always dangerous. That will always lead to disaster. Such a view is destructive of Christian liberty and weakens the lawful, the other lawful authorities. <clears throat> in addition, we must keep in mind that civil governments do not produce any goods. Therefore, under normal circumstances, it can only distribute what is taken through taxation. State-run distribution programs are unscriptural and sinful for two reasons. First, and this is important, they're not based on love, charity, and voluntary giving, but coercion. The person who refuses to pay his taxes is arrested, and he can be imprisoned in America, he can be imprisoned and fined. He's threatened with coercion. With this system, the biblical expression, God loves a cheerful giver, 2 Corinthians 9, 7, is replaced by pay up or suffer the consequences. Pay up or suffer the consequences. So that's one problem. Second, the money that families could use to help other family members to fulfill their covenantal responsibilities. We're not supposed to have old folks' homes where people go to rot sit in front of the television until they die uh, and get pumped full of drugs. Uh, people are supposed to, children are supposed to take care of their uh, parents when they're aged. The Bible's clear about that. But the state, by taking the responsibilities of the family, weakens these kind of things. So, it takes away money from what ought to be used, family members who want to help the poor, that they personally know Okay, they personally know such people. It's taken away, and it's spent without their supervision or approval. If you knew how your tax dollars were spent on welfare programs, you'd be extremely angry. I, in the 1970s, I actually worked in a welfare office for a while. And my, my conclusion was is that none of those people should have been getting any money. Maybe, maybe you know, certainly not from the state, but... They were all cheating the system. They were cheating the system. They could afford nice clothes, they could afford cars, they could afford marijuana and, 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 and beer, uh, and they're getting welfare checks. <clears throat> it is diametrically opposed to the system set up by Scripture. But, and this is what is brought up by uh, the old style establishmentarians, did not Darius the king Fund the temple, the building of the temple. Did he not give his own money for the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem? Indeed he did. The Bible's clear about that. But it was done so not from a tax on his own people, or a tax on the Jews, but from his own personal treasury. Darius funded the temple from revenues collected from conquered peoples. Listen to what Ezra 6.8 says. It was done at the king's expense. He was wealthy. 
He had a lot of gold and silver. He just conquered a bunch of nations. He had a bunch of booty. And out of that, he paid for the rebuilding of the temple. He used the tribute money and booty as he saw fit. By the way, keep in mind, Darius, people point to him as a Christian king, an example of a Christian king. Uh, a lot of archaeology and history has been done on Darius. And Darius paid not simply for the temple in Jerusalem, but he paid for the rebuilding of temples to all sorts of pagan deities. So he was, he was basically a pluralist. He was not an example of a Christian king. <clears throat> the Jews also contributed to the rebuilding of temp the temple with voluntary tithes. Ezra 1.6, 268 to 69. And in 68 it says, the heads of the father's houses offered freely for the house of God. This understanding is reinforced by how the Jews supported the temple under the revival of Hezekiah. And this is very illuminating. Listen to this. This is 2 Chronicles 31, 3 to 4. 3 and 4. The king also appointed a portion of his possessions for the burnt offerings. Okay, it comes right out of the king's pocket. Moreover, he commanded the people who dwelt in Jerusalem to contribute support for the priests and the Levites, that they might devote themselves to the law of the Lord. Okay, note, the king did not set up a state tax. He did not tax the population to support the priests, Levites, and the house of God, but rather set the example by giving out of his own possessions... The Bible's clear about that. He gave out of his own money. Then he commanded the people not to give to the civil government, to, but to obey God's law and support the church's ministry with their tithes and offerings. Here's an example of a godly king. Here's an example of how the establishment principle should work. This is precisely what they did, verses 5 and 8. The first fruits of grain, wine, oil, honey, as well as the tithes of oxen, sheep, and other things were brought directly, it says, into the house of the Lord. The money went directly in the support of the church, in the support of the teach, teachers of the church. The money went directly from the people into the house of the Lord. It did not go to the king or the state so the state could pay their salaries. The civil magistrates did not so much as touch this produce and money. With such clear passages on how this church is to be supported and maintained, we are puzzled as to why so many godly divines were in favor of supporting the ministry through a state tax. Now, I think we have the advantage now of writing after the 20th century, the late 1800s and especially the 20th century, when we had these, all these examples of statism totally out of control. So we have an advantage there. <clears throat> The king ordered the people to do their duty according to the law. He did not make up a new tax. Case closed. Case closed. Okay, well, that bring, that's all general teaching. Now we come uh, to the refutation of Christian statism through a study of specific passages. If the statist understanding of establishmentarianism was true, we ought to be able to find it by looking at specific passages in Scripture. But as we shall see, the Bible teaches the very opposite of Christian socialism or welfare statism. In this section, we're going to look at only those areas of the old form of the establishment principle that contradict the Word of God and will demonstrate why such views are contrary to Scripture. Number one, state schools. State schools. Christian statists argue that the civil magistrates would set up a public school system and that colleges and universities be established and maintained by tax funds. And what is the proof text they offer for this? They do have a proof text. 2 Kings 6.1. And this, this proof text is so bad, it's so bad I actually had to double check to make sure this was actually what they intended. But this is the proof text that is offered. Here's what it says. And the sons of the prophet said to Elijah, See now, the place where we dwell uh, with you is too small for us. Okay, that's the school of the prophets. Here's what Matthew Henry says. And I love Matthew Henry, and I, I think everybody should have a copy of Matthew Henry. And Charles Spurgeon used to read all six volumes every year, once a year. Wish we could all do that. 
but uh, his comments assume statism here. Quote, it was a sign that Joram, Joram was king and Jezebel ruled too, or the sons of the prophets when they wanted room, that is a larger school, would have needed only to apply to the government, <laughs> not to consult among themselves about the enlarging the enlargement of the buildings. Okay, they, the sons of the prophets basically built an addition on their building because they, they were running out of room. Matthew Henry says, oh, if, if this was a biblical time, they had a biblical king, they just to go to the government and get money from the government. Well, the number of problems in this argument first. The second king's passage only tells us that the school of the prophets was growing, and it's nothing to say pro or con about government schools. If anything, it says, hey, look, if you want to expand your school, do it yourself. Get out there and build, a, build an addition on it. Second, the law of God and the New Testament epistles make it perfectly clear that education was the responsibility of the family, and that whole families were instructed in the faith by the uh, Levites and pastor teachers in the New Covenant era. We looked at that somewhat last week. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6, Deuteronomy chapter 6. God always places the education of children squarely on the shoulders of the parents. The father, the covenant head, is responsible to make sure it gets done and to make sure it's a Christian education. That is the responsibility of the parents. It is not the responsibility of the state at all. State education did not exist in Israel, by the way. And colleges and universities did not exist until the high Middle Ages. The first university, I believe, was 14th century in France. Okay, they're, they're a rather late invention. Third, if the state is given power over schools, whether through funding or the curriculum or the choosing of teachers, it will have replaced the parents in this area and will have incredible power over the future of the country. Okay. Whoever controls the children controls the future. You do not give the state that power. You keep it with the parents where the Bible keeps it. And the reason that is so important is because when things go bad, it's usually the state that goes bad first. Sometimes it's the church that goes bad first. Many times, in fact, many times it's the church that goes bad first. But the state goes bad, you want to have maintained control over your own children and their future. <clears throat> The state's version of the establishment principle is naive and dangerous, for it concentrates power in the state and leaves the family vulnerable when the civil government becomes corrupt. If you only knew, now there have been books written about this, but if you only knew the kind of stuff that was taught in public schools today, you would be completely floored. You'd be shocked. The pro-homosexual propaganda. Now, I remember when I was back in school, uh, well, this, it, we were taught that the Indians were sinless gods, basically, the American Indians, and the United States was evil, among other things. <clears throat> and we were taught that all religions are equal. There is no true one religion. That was taught openly when I was in school. It's even worse now. The basic premise of Christian statism is that since the civil government has the power to tax and coerce, it should use its power to establish Christian schools. The problem with such thinking is that God alone owns all children, and he has delegated the authority to educate to parents, not to the state, and only to the church, yes, but really in matters pertaining to the whole counsel of God. And that is with the parents there. If you look at the Old Testament, if you study public worship in the Old Testament, their children were with them. They, were all, they didn't have separate Sunday school classes and youth groups and all that stuff that came in the late 1800s. That's all new. Uh, they didn't have that in the Old Testament. If Christian freedom is to, be, is to be maintained, the state's jurisdiction must be limited by God's word. And I think we'll stop there. When we come back, the old style establishmentarians believe that the state should use their tax funds for such things as health care, welfare programs, and poor relief. So we'll come back, we're going to spend a whole hour talking about the biblical teaching on the poor. The Bible, this is an area, the Bible doesn't say a lot about education, it just says the parents do it or to do it, and it basically leaves it there. And it talks about the Levites teaching and so forth, religious education. But when you get to the poor, 
and the widow and the orphan and the helpless and the foreigner and all that. The Bible has a lot to say. And it is extremely detailed. And if we accept Christian welfare statism, this idea that the state should tax people and set up its own welfare programs, well, you're going to deny tons of biblical teaching that is explicit. So we're going to look at that next. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for these promises that Christ will have uh, the Gentiles come unto him in this era, and that kings and queens will bow the knee to Christ and do what they can, use their authority for the sake of helping the Church of Christ. We pray that this would come to pass, Lord. We pray for reformation in the church, that the church would accept this teaching. <clears throat> and we pray that civil magistrates would bow the knee to Jesus Christ and serve him and only make those things illegal that God makes illegal. And they would praise the good instead of what they're doing today, which is praising the wicked. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.